Hi, everyone, and thanks for joining us. We're getting closer to in-person gatherings, but for now, we're enjoying welcoming so many of you to our virtual discussions. I'm Roger Zackheim, director of the Reagan Institute, which is the home of the Reagan Foundation in the nation's capital. I am pleased to welcome to our Sutton Family Auditorium today, House Armed Services Committee Chairman Adam Smith, now in his 13th term representing Washington's 9th District. Chairman Smith is a recipient of the Reagan Foundation's Peace Through Strength Award and serves as the honorary chair of the Reagan National Defense Forum. And I'm pleased to report that RNDF will be back in person this December at the Reagan Library in California. Now, before the election in 2020, Chairman Smith was interviewed by Defense News and was asked what defense policy would look like under Democratic leadership. To summarize, he said, there would be a pivot in three directions. Embracing alliances, a greater emphasis on diplomacy and development, and an even smarter defense budget. He said, quote, it's going to focus not just on building a lot of stuff, but on building the things that are most crucial to meet our national security needs, end quote. So with the Biden administration releasing the budget outline, the skinny budget, last week, it's a great time to ask the chairman whether these goals will be met and whether the country is on track to address the global threats we face. Providing the basis for our conversation following his remarks, as well as the subsequent panel, is the recent strategic choices exercise that the Reagan Institute hosted with the Center for Strategic and Budgetary Assessments. We conducted these exercises using CSBA's interactive decision-making tool which allowed the group of defense experts and policymakers to see the effects of various budget choices. The report we published following those exercises outlined some very real consequences of the hard choices that would come from cutting the defense budget. So, Mr. Chairman, we have lots of ground to cover today. We thank you for being here. So let's dive right in. The floor is yours, and we have plenty to discuss afterwards. Thank you. Well, I want to thank Roger very much for this opportunity and the Reagan Institute for their work on national security policy. I've always enjoyed our discussions. The Reagan Forum is always a highlight uh, where you bring everyone together and we have a robust discussion about the correct path forward. And I guess to answer Roger's question as to whether or not we're going to accomplish those goals that I laid out, I guess I would sum it up simply and say we, we have a lot of work to do. Um, and by way of opening remarks, I've got four basic points I want to make as we enter into the budget discussion, the budget debate. And there are points I've made before, but, but number one, we really need to review our national defense policy. Because the national defense policy right now is asking us to do a lot. If you look at the document, basically it lays out in, in no particular order, but number one, we have to be able to win an all-out war with China. Uh, preferably, we need to dominate that conflict have a military big enough and strong enough that China feels like in a direct conflict, and by the way, in a direct conflict in China, in, in their part of the world, we have to be able to dominate them. And while we're doing that, we also have to be able to deal with Russia in Eastern Europe and deter what's going on. And we've seen in the news this week as they've uh, c brought forces to the border with Ukraine. Now, they've, they've done that before, and nothing uh, has happened beyond that, but it all is always worth being concerned about. Then we do have the nuclear threat, without question. Uh, but from Russia's nuclear arsenal, China's growing nuclear arsenal, we need to have a deterrent capability in our nuclear arsenal and with our anti-missile uh, technology. So we've got to do all of that. And then, oh, by the way, we've got North Korea. We have to make sure that we are supporting South Korea uh, with the number of troops necessary to deter North Korea uh, from having any idea about attacking South Korea. We've got Iran to worry about in the Middle East, and then we've got transnational terrorist threats. And, and the biggest point that I want people to understand is when you read the national defense strategy, the goals that it lays out are basically unachievable. Now, part of that is because of the sheer cost of it, but we don't, we, we don't have the people to meet that many different needs, to fight that many battles at the same time. And this has been the case for quite a while, and this has led to a very difficult situation within the defense budget. We can never possibly do what we are being told that we have to do. We are sort of perpetually chasing our tail, which as we all know, you don't catch it when you do that. 
we have the constant complaint that our combatant commanders, they make requests for forces, whether it's requests for aircraft carriers, numbers of troops, number of drones, number of planes. And every year we can look at those requests and we can see that some shockingly low number um, of those requests have been fulfilled. We have the yearly um, exercise of having the unfunded requirements list. And all this adds up to an overall sense of panic that we are not meeting our national security needs. Now, the number one thing I would suggest is that we need to re-examine that national defense policy. Is it really necessary to do everything that is in it? I think we need to get back to a core principle of what is truly necessary and what is possible. Now, in saying that, you can reach one of two conclusions. One, you could say, if I'm saying we can't achieve our national defense policy, you can view it as a borderline existential threat. Um, that basically, oh my gosh, how can we not achieve that, that core principle? Or you can say that we don't really need to do everything in the national defense policy. And I want to make it clear that I am firmly in that second camp. I believe that we can protect ourselves. I believe that we can protect ourselves certainly against existential threats. But we can also meet our national security needs with a much more focused idea of what those national security needs are. And that would be job one. Now, the second challenge that is coming is there is a growing sense uh, on both the right and the left amongst some people that the U.S. should retreat from the world. Now, they, they frequently don't put it that way, but that's the general complaint. You know, why are we in the Middle East? Why are we in Afghanistan? Why are we responsible for security in Asia um, is part of it. And then there's another part of it that is even more problematic, and that is a growing number of folks who think, that the U.S. is sort of a malign actor in the world, and that if we just retreated from the world, we wouldn't have all of those threats. Now, I'll certainly admit that if you go back over the last 75 years of history, the United States of America has made mistakes. Um, and in some cases, we have been aggressive in places that have created more problems than they've solved. But overall, I also want to be clear that while I say that our current national defense strategy is too big, too ambitious, and too unrealistic in terms of what our needs are, I also feel very strongly that the U.S. must be actively engaged in the world to create a more peaceful and prosperous world. Now, as Roger mentioned in the opening remarks, I think focusing on partnerships, focusing on diplomacy, and focusing on development are ways that we can do that in a more cooperative fashion that will yield positive results. But the military is also part of it. Um, the U.S., as the guarantor of security um, in South Korea, has been responsible for making sure that there is a South Korea. Um, otherwise, North Korea would have taken over and Kim Jong-un would be a problem not just for the North, but for the entire Korean Peninsula. Our presence, I believe, has contributed to peace and stability, um, certainly in Europe and in other parts of Asia as well. I want the U.S. to be actively engaged in the world, but I feel we have relied too much on the military and not on some of these other tools going forward. But as we head into the budget debate, that's going to be the basic frame that you're going to look at. You're going to have folks in the, you know, we must have the strongest possible defense camp saying we've got to spend more money because, oh my goodness, look at all of these needs that we aren't meeting. You're going to have some folks on the left who are saying there are other more important priorities domestically, and the U.S. military isn't helping anything anyway, so we should cut the budget. That, that, that is going to be a fight. And again, I think we need to rethink the national defense strategy to be realistic about what we can accomplish and what we need to accomplish. But we should not shrink from the idea that having a strong military is part of how we work towards a more peaceful and prosperous world. Now, the final piece of this, I think, is actually the most important. And that is, how do we start spending the money better? Because that, that's what makes me crazy. We get hung up on the debate about what the number should be. You know? and, and when you get into the number, you know, what, what the defense budget is depends on what you consider to be part of the defense budget. Do you include the Department of Energy? So the number bounces around a lot. The number I operate off of is the number based on the Department of Energy being included, which was $741 billion last year and is roughly $753 billion in the proposed budget uh, for the Biden administration this year. We get obsessed with that number. I think that, that number, it could go up, it could go down. The key part is, what are we doing with that money? How can we look at the budget right now and get more efficient and effective? And I think we need to really look closely at that question. I cannot possibly, in the couple of minutes I have left here, get into all of it. But I do want to throw out a couple of suggestions, and this is my third point. Number one, technology is unbelievably important. Uh, the study um, that Eric Schmidt and Bob Work did on AI, 
on what we need to do to be leaders in AI is crucially important. You can think of AI as, as a borderline Manhattan project. Just like back in World War II, we had to get uh, to nuclear weapons first before Hitler did, or we were all going to lose. Um, we have to get to AI first, or we are going to be in a much, much weaker position. It's the key to everything going forward. That's the one big technology, but there are others. How can we use emerging technologies to better project defense? Un un unmanned systems are going to be a crucial part of that. Command and control, I mean, cybersecurity. You can have all the weapon systems in the world. We can build all the airplanes and all the ships, and if our adversaries have the ability to shut all of those platforms down by either taking out a satellite or a cyber attack, then that is, is really spending a lot of money in a very unwise way. The Pentagon has got to get better at how it purchases technology in general and software in particular. That means building a robust relationship with the key tech centers uh, in this country, restrengthening that relationship and really looking at that piece. It's a crucial, crucial part of it. I also want to emphasize there's a lot of talk about personnel costs within the military, and certainly I see the challenge within personnel costs, but we have an all-volunteer military. We are going to have to pay them well and take care of them to make sure we continue to have an all-volunteer military. Uh, the notion that we can cut personnel costs to get our way out of our budget problems I think is very overstated. I also want to say that when it comes to personnel, another way we can be more effective and efficient is realize the type of people we, we, we need. That's sort of the one big takeaway from the AI study that I mentioned earlier. We need the people with those skills to do it. So how is the military recruiting? And I think looking at how we change that recruiting effort is, is important. You know, you may not be able to pass the physical fitness test, you know, but if you're a computer genius, do we really want to reject you from serving in the military at this point? We need to rethink what we need in terms of personnel to get there. And the last point, actually I think it's the last point, there might be a second one, but um, is competition. And this came out recently when I was critical of the F-35, uh, and a lot of folks reacted to that. A lot of points contained in that. But the one that I really want to emphasize, we need competition within the military. When you give out sole source, well, it's not sole source, you give, once you give out a contract, once you do the program of record, you are in a bit of a bind because then the contractor has you. You have to buy what they have. We need to try to put competition in wherever we can. Now, I understand. That's not always going to be possible. I would not suggest for a second that we should have built two F-35s just to make sure that they can compete against each other. But how about we compete the maintenance? How about we create opportunities so not just one entity has the contract? One of the big problems with the F-35 that I don't think even came out in my remarks is the fact that it costs $38,000 an hour to fly. Our goal was for it to cost $25,000 an hour. So that's a big problem. We would like it to be cheaper. But if you're the one providing the maintenance, if you're Lockheed Martin, what's the problem? You're paying me $38,000 an hour to do something, and you're telling me you'd really like to get down to the point where you're only paying me $25,000 an hour. We need incentives in place to get to that lower price point. And then, of course, there's the whole engine discussion, which we went through, as we've now seen that the engine is proving problematic in a variety of ways. A number of us wanted to compete that. We wanted to keep a second engine alive. Competition works. And I think at the Reagan Defense Forum, you know, with Ronald Reagan in the background there, um, we can say competition works. And we need to be as creative as possible to create that competition. As I said, it's not always going to be possible. Big defense systems are the nature of it. But we should not walk away from competition. We should look for any way possible to make sure that the taxpayer is getting the most for their dollars. And actually, the last point I want to make is, is on regulations. Um, and competition, technology, all things are key. But a couple of the other ways that we can get to spending money more wisely, one, we've got to do the audit. I know some people have said, well, the audit's so expensive, is it really worth it? If we don't know where we're spending the money, it's that much more difficult to make sure we're spending it well. The Pentagon still has huge chunks of money that are not properly accounted for. We can't get to the efficiencies we want. And lastly, when we're looking at regulating how we do these contracts with the programs of record, it's too much in a box. There isn't enough freedom for our program managers to make innovative decisions about what they want and what they need to achieve our goals. Ideally, in national security, we set the objective. 
this is what we want to be able to do. And then we create a maximum amount of flexibility in terms of how you achieve that objective. That is not the way we do it in the Pentagon for the most part. There are all kinds of boxes that you've got to check all the way up to here. And as long as you check all those boxes, you're fine, even if at the end of the day you don't solve the problem. And I will, I will close, actually, with, a, with an analogy to the AI technology I've talked about that really was sort of an aha moment for me when I read it. I was trying to figure out what AI technology is. I'm not naturally a, a tech person. I am naturally a problem solver, however. And I read about how the best way to understand AI is to think about chess. You know, they made the, the big blue machine that was going to have a machine playing chess. But the way they did that when they did it originally is they plugged into the computer program everything that we humans knew about chess. The rules, the maneuvers, the history, and I don't know a lot about chess. I haven't even watched The Queen's Gambit yet. Uh, I'm going to have to do that. But it was all in there. And by and large, the machine then took all that information and did reasonably well. Um, there were, however, humans that were able to beat it occasionally. Well, when they programmed the most recent computer, they didn't do any of that. They just used AI and told the computer, here are the rules of chess. You figure it out. Here's your objective. OK, your objective is to win. The computer is completely unbeatable. And most interestingly, the computer does a whole bunch of things that experts, the best chess players in the world, look at it and go, well, that's crazy. You can't do that. That's never, oh, well, it did work. That's the type of innovation that we need within the Pentagon, not to be locked into all of these tight little boxes where we can't be creative. Technology, innovation, the rapid pace of change is what's going to get us to the point where we have strong national security. We have the technology. We have the people who are able to do this. We've got to take the straitjacket off, let that creativity go forward so that we can solve problems in a cost-effective way. Bottom line, there are not enough incentives right now in the way we spend money at the Pentagon to save money and get the best value for what you're doing. We, we need to change that. Um, and we can talk about 741 or 780 or 600 or whatever. Whatever that number is, we need to get more out of that money being spent. That, that's the big goal that I have for this year and beyond as chairman of the committee. Um, we've got great partners on the committee. Mike Rogers is a terrific ranking member. Um, I'm really enjoying working with the Biden administration. We've got a great bipartisan consensus, House and Senate, with Jack Reed as the new chairman. Jim Inhofe was terrific to work with for the two years that he was chairman and continues to be his ranking member. We've got the people in place. We need to make the right decisions for the country. Thank you. Virtual applause going. Uh, there we go. <laughs> Thank you it so is, much. It, this is still weird, by <laughs> the way. But the old speaking to the empty room. You exactly. Know? Well, well done. You did it. You did it quite well. Uh, and welcome to the Reagan Institute. Exciting to have a, have you here. We've had you out in California, but um, a first for us to have you here in D.C. Uh, as usual, your points. You cover a lot of ground. Uh, straightforward, clear, and and taking on uh, the orthodoxy, uh, which I. I know from sitting next to you for endless hours during markups you enjoy yes, yeah. doing. Um, so let me start where you started, which is you just blew up the national defense strategy. Um, yes. You recall that I sat on a, a commission uh, led by uh, Ambassador Eric Edelman and, and Admiral Gary Ruffhead, which endorsed in a bipartisan way, Dr. Kath Hicks was one of the people on that commission, uh, the national defense strategy. But uh, you just said it's unachievable. It's too big, it's too ambitious, it's too unrealistic. A lot of twos there. Yeah. Um, the Biden administration came out with an interim national security strategy. Um, and I guess in your mind, that interim national security strategy will lead the pathway to a revised national defense strategy to justify a budget, which we'll get to, even though you don't want to talk top line or don't, you, know, you, you want to focus on other things. What does that new national defense strategy need to look like? What, if you're advising Secretary Austin, no doubt you're speaking with him, you're talking to Deputy Secretary Hicks, and you're saying, you got to move off this too ambitious national defense strategy. What are you cutting out? Yeah. Well, first of all, obviously, this is not peculiar to national security policy. I mean, mm -hmm. Way back when I was in my first term in the state senate, I served on the Juvenile Justice Reform Task Force. And you know, we were talking about what we need to do to better deal with uh, at-risk youth, status offenders, and all of that. And, the ideas kept flowing out and flowing out and flowing out, and I was the one person sitting on there, okay, that's great, that's wonderful, I know we'd love to be able to do this, but here's the amount of money we have, here's what we're dealing with. And sooner or later, everyone else on the commission said, you know, this issue is just too important. Money, money cannot be a factor. Right. It's like, well, okay. <laughs> um, I wish I lived in that world, right. but I don't. Um, so so it, it is a problem writ large, and it really comes down to managing risk. 
and you know, with the, the coronavirus, I think we all understand this, people are not naturally good at managing risk because we don't like to think about risk for the most part. And we, we, we prefer to go in one of two directions, either one, wish the problem away. Right. Okay. Well, there is no risk. There's no problem. The coronavirus is a hoax. Right. It doesn't exist. Okay. Or two, we're going to do absolutely everything we can to make sure that all risk is eliminated because risk is unacceptable. All right. Um, neither approach is particularly effective. So I think the problem in national defense strategy is when we look at, well, you're telling me China's not a threat. You're telling me North Korea is not a threat. You're telling me transnational terrorists aren't a threat. Uh, no, I'm saying, how do we manage that risk? And now I will attempt to answer your question. <laughs> okay. Number one, where China is concerned, right. we are building towards the notion that the only way to deter China is to have a military that is so big and so strong that we can guarantee not just win a war with them, but dominate mm -hmm. so that they don't even think about taking us on. Okay. Um, China is a pretty big country, number one. And number two, we're talking about the fight happening in their backyard, but is not within their territory. I mean, that's, and I understood when I made those remarks that I was going to, you know, it's, it's sort of in, in the South like, China Like Taiwan area right. or, or but, some of our allies and friends. I mean, it's you, a place, but, yeah. But you've seen the war games, Roger. Inevitably, it gets right into their territory pr pretty quick. Um, so it is kind of ultimately going to wind up in their territory as it's currently outlined. Do we really need to do that? What we need to do is we need to make sure that China doesn't think that they can take Taiwan without consequences that are unacceptable to them. Right. We need to make sure that they don't think that they can, you know, shut off the, the, the shipping lanes um, in the South China Sea without consequences, that they can't, you know, grab territory from other countries. I believe if we build alliances and have enough of a credible threat to bloody their nose, as it were, past the point that they want to do it, that's acceptable. Okay. I also think that partnerships and alliances in places like Eastern Europe can be enormously helpful to us in, in dealing with Russia. I think that we can have a more conservative approach and we can have a deterrent approach. This is my argument about the nuclear arsenal. Mm -hmm. We have to have a nuclear deterrent. Right. I, I know there are some on the left who disagree with me on that and they imagine a world where there are no nuclear weapons and okay, but you know, I, I personally- We all aspire for that. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I, well, I don't know that I do aspire for that mm. because you, you can't unring the bell. Okay. Okay. If we can come up with some way to make the technology completely impossible so go. that nobody can build a nuclear weapon, I'm all in. Right. Okay. I don't see that as possible, but if you want to pursue that and figure it out, great. Um, but if we can't do that, we will need a deterrent. But does that deterrent need to be the, the four, five, six thousand nuclear weapons that, that we keep talking about? Or does it need to be a deterrent that is so large that nobody even thinks about launching a weapon because of the unacceptable attack on them? And we talk about China. I know China is building more missiles. They're still a long way away from us. But in terms of numbers, but, right. but the quality is yeah. improving. Yeah. Right. Uh, indeed. So I, I just think that we can get to a deterrent value with our nuclear arsenal for less than people are talking about. And we always imagine worst case scenarios and say we have to, we have to imagine the worst case scenario and then we have to spend a little bit more than that. That's a good point, though. Um, you know, Drop so, the so that's what I'm talking about, and that's the way I hope we'll think about it. And I hope we'll we'll look at it from the standpoint. So, but let, let, let me let me drill down on that because sure. I think uh, as you adjust the mic, I think yeah, there we go. Um, you know, I'm listening to you describe this all this and national defense strategy that is less ambitious, right, or or or, or more, realistic, more realistic, more realistic. But it really sounds to me what the previous administration was trying to achieve. And I'll give you a couple of examples, okay? Uh, there was increased reliance on nuclear weapons because the last national defense strategy recognized that you're only going to be able to deter a China robustly and then you're going to rely on nuclear weapons to deter other spoilers, whether it be in Iran or North Korea or Russia. Or another example, we've had uh, roughly 12 years of presidents uh, both parties who have said we need to do less in the Middle East, focus our resources in in Asia, right, or Indo-Pacific region. Of course, we haven't actually done. That. Well, that's my point, right? So, <laughs> right. so we've we've tried in terms of, of word and been less effective indeed, but put forward a strategy that was trying to be less ambitious and focusing more on where the threats reside, right? Uh, and then just the last point on China, I'll let you 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 respond. The idea was simply to try to get some deterrence so they don't try to take a Taiwan. So they don't yeah. uh, 
continue expanding their building. Not what the, that's not what the national defense strategy says. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, I agree with that completely. Okay. That's great. That's not what the national defense strategy says. It says we have to be prepared to win, win an all-out war with China. Uh, I don't know if it says that exactly, but that's in big. the event you got to the conflict. Yes. But of course, you tried to deter them from sure. getting there, which is very similar to what you've just said. Yeah. So I, I guess you know part of it is really you know as you say that we need to we need to actually do what we said we were going to do. There were actually more troops in the Middle East at the end of the Trump administration than there were when he started. Um, you know, because Saudi Arabia, because all stuff that we, we float in there. Now, granted, they're not in conflict. Correct, not in Iraq or Afghanistan. But, but you know, I mean, Mark Esper, you know, banged his head against this wall for the better part of, of, of two years, you know, as he was doing his bottom-up reviews to try to get to exactly that, to say, if, you, if you're asking me to do more here, then you've got to show me where I'm going to do less. And he was pushed back against in a lot of these different places um, as he tried to do that. So... I think we need to look at that. It's also a matter of, it's also not so much just a matter of saying we're going to do less in places, but are there systems and weapons technologies and capabilities that for less money can achieve the same deterrent level? Okay, and that's where we get into the technology piece and the understanding what's going to happen is we've seen in the wars that were fought in Crimea um, and the azerbaijan Armenia conflict, you know, very low tech, you know, drones and um, technology, targeting technology, command and control stuff that didn't cost much money was really decisive. You know, how can we achieve those goals in a more cost effective way? That's part of it, too. And it, just to build on that point, you know, I'm, my own takeaway from looking at the national defense strategy was we need to be present in the Middle East. But the manner in which we're present needed to be adjusted. So to what you were just talking about, you probably don't need a fifth generation fighter aircraft. Uh, in terms of conventional high-end capability to, d to deal with the threats there, put those to the more, where the more high-end threat resides in Asia. We haven't been able to do that. Um, you know, so get to these uh, technologies that cost less to accomplish the mission, as opposed to just this binary choice, we're in the Middle East or we're out of the Middle East, because, as you know, no president has been able to do that, even with President Trump or President Obama advocating as much. Well, I also think a part of this is understanding the limitations of military might. Okay, now, and I, I made the point in my opening remarks that there are those who think that the U.S. military is a malign actor in the world and would be better off if they weren't there just in general. I don't agree with that. Um, I, I don't agree that Russia and China and North Korea and Iran and all these terrorist groups would just sort of go away right. if, we, if we let them. Um, but I also think that we have become excessively reliant on the military as a deterrent tool and underappreciative of the downsides. Um, and I think Afghanistan is a great example, okay? You know, we can imagine that what we want in Afghanistan is we want a peaceful, stable government that respects human rights, um, and that's great, okay? The, our military is not gonna be able to achieve that, and, and, and we've, we've learned that from 20 years, and yet we continue to stick around based on this sort of conditions base. Mm -hmm. Well, the conditions that we want to achieve are, by and large, unachievable. A and meanwhile, it is an enormous expense, and it is also undermines our credibility. Credibility is the wrong way to put it. Having a whole bunch of U.S. troops in a Muslim country has a downside. I mean, hmm. foreign countries don't like having the U.S. military walking up and down their streets unless it's absolutely necessary. So unless we're really getting something out of it. We need to rethink about rethink that presence. That's a way to say. Well, too. We, we could debate that because you know, right. if the alternative is the Taliban, I'm sure the the general enlisted U.S. military person, you know, the, the troopers is welcome. But but the other point I want to make about They're Afghanistan. They're not welcome if people are still shooting at them. Well, uh, definitely, you can't deny we've had decades of violence there. Yeah. But in terms of achievable goals in Afghanistan, um, isn't the goal simply not to allow it to be the safe haven? I carried on 11. So, would you uh, support a Biden administration decision to maintain whatever it, that number is for a counterterrorism force of a couple thousand or so? I mean, I think I, Dr. Esper was, yeah. was with us, Secretary Esper, and, and he said that was the recommendation yeah. he left the previous administration with. Yeah. I don't believe that I would as I've looked at it. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not that I don't think that there is the possibility of a terrorist threat there, but again, it's managing risk. What is the risk of, <coughs> even if the Taliban come back into power in some form? Right. And it's hard to imagine that the Taliban would be safe and comfortable in power. There's, there's a conflict there. 
you know, they're always going to be dealing it. Right now, ISIS is coming after them. Right. Um, if they were back in power, what is the risk of an Al-Qaeda-like group reforming without us being able to do anything about it and attacking us the way, on, they, the way they did on 9-11? I think that risk is relatively low. Um, even, even without force presence in, in Afghanistan? Yeah. Okay. I mean, well, look, I mean, <clears throat> and it's not just Afghanistan. I mean, hell, there's, there's groups that form in Pakistan, all right? Um, as, as we well know, there are groups that have safe haven in Pakistan that could potentially be a problem for us. Pakistan works with it a little bit, but right. mm, not entirely. You know, should we put 3,000 troops in Pakistan, whether they want them there or not, in order to make sure that there's no terrorist threat coming out of there? You know, Somalia, Syria. Um, you know, and, and I know we have presence, although the Somalia thing's in flux because of what the Trump administration did in the last couple of months. But there we're talking about a couple hundred, but and we're you, talking about relying but on you neighbors. Were, you, for so. long, before you were chairman uh, and ranking member, you, you were subcommittee chair of, of the subcommittee oversaw SOCOM. You were yeah. intimately involved with the building of that capability. I mean, you know better than anybody else that having presence on the ground someplace, some level, is critical and a great way to mitigate the risk. Um, not having the presence in Afghanistan or not having the presence in Horn of Africa, really, in your mind, don't you think that would invite and reduce our ability to, to appropriately mitigate that risk? Oh, sure. I mean, there's no question there is <coughs> some risk in not having a presence, okay? But what's the risk of having the presence? And how big and how costly is it? What I'm a huge fan mm -hmm. of is, well, right before everything got shut down in February, I was in Niger and Mali. Um, and we have a small number of forces in both of those countries. This that, is a Trans-Sahel region in Africa. Yeah, yeah. That, that work with, with partners. It's a relatively small number. Um, and I know four uh, service members were killed in Niger uh, about four years ago now, I think it was three years ago. Uh, but the risk is relatively low and the numbers are relatively low as opposed to the sheer volume of forces that we would have to have in Afghanistan in order to make that work. And that's where I think the, the cost-benefit falls off. And All the right. benefit is Well, is you have su good. successfully, 15 minutes, we haven't discussed the top line. You're very effective at, at, at making sure. all these great strategic points. But i got to go back to the budget. Sure. And, and, and here's the way I want to frame it for you. You, you just outlined, uh, we'll call it the Chairman Adam Smith National Defense Strategy, distinct from the President Trump national defense strategy. As I listen to you, it sounds like it would still cost pretty much the same. In other words, when, when, when Jim Mattis uh, uh, would come before your committee and say, we need 3 to 5 percent real growth every year to meet the defense strategy, don't you think he'd say the same thing about the Adam Smith national defense strategy, that we need 3 to 5 percent real growth to do what you're describing, which is deter China, right? Also deal with, with Russia and deal with all the threats just in a smarter, more effective uh, fashion. Yeah, I can't. I can't say what Jim Mattis would or wouldn't say about that. <laughs> okay. and as you well know, he only said that three to five percent thing like like once. It was not. It was not a regular, repeated talking point. Right. Um, but I will tell you this: No, I do not think we need a three to five percent real growth over inflation in order to achieve what I'm talking about. And if we do, we're not doing our job. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, I really believe that. Um, you know, now, you know, could we do it with a ten percent cut? I mean, I'm still hung up on something that a, that a VC said to me about 15 years ago where he said he has not yet met the organization that can't get cut by 10% and get better at what they do. Okay. Um, now, Pentagon's a big organization. they got a lot of responsibilities. I'd get a little nervous at that number, and that's why I don't support and voted against that, that, that level of a cut just last year. You know, but if you're telling me that we can't achieve what I just described for $753 billion, which is what President Biden just put out there, I disagree. Um, I think there are all kinds of options um, to get more out of the money we're spending. We could not spend, you know, seven, eight billion dollars on the, on the wall on the southern border, just for instance. And, and let me focus on that point for just a second. As we're talking about, right. you know, yeah, we just can't survive without three to five percent growth. It's impossible. Right, to, right. And yet we have all the Republicans celebrating Donald Trump's, you know, rebuilding of the military and all this. Right. And they were able to find eight billion dollars for the wall on the southern border. Like I just, oh gosh, look, I got a twenty dollar bill in my pocket. Right. I didn't even realize it. I'll get lunch. But but defense analysts would say that seven eight billion dollars came at a cost of modernization. And in fact, I'm sure you would agree that the. Trump rebuild the military was really a Trump res restoration of readiness, but really never got to modernization. Yeah, no, I think that I think that is that is true. 
Um, and that is why I think the real question, uh, real question, one of many, is what does that modernization look like? And if that modernization looks like the DDG-1000, future combat systems, the expeditionary fighting vehicle, the F-35, the LCS, then that's an utter disaster, okay? And how much money was spent on all of those programs? We gotta get smarter about that. And if we get smarter about that, I think we can do it for less than $753 billion. Facts not yet in evidence to see where we could go ahead, even a successful program of record that uh, would come in and, and, and allow us to modernize. I mean, as you know, the operation maintenance piece of the budget is the one that the Congress and the Pentagon haven't been able to tackle. That's the one that rises year over yeah, well year. Well, that's the $38,000 an hour to uh, operate the Well, it's true. So you, so, you, so you have the maintenance and sustainment of these programs of record. But, you know, you, you acknowledge in your remarks that not only do we have to deal with uh, having a military ready for a conflict, we hope and pray we'll never get there, but also having a military today that can compete and to deter. And to do that, you need weapons platforms. You can't just Absolutely. really take, take uh, you know, a vacation. So the operations and maintenance piece is something that keeps on going up because we keep on pressing the military, you know, to maintain what we're calling well, the peace now or this or the steady state. Well, keeping on pressing them to maintain weapons systems that were poorly thought out in the first place. And I would submit that part of the reason that some of these weapon systems were poorly thought out is because of the fact that we have this over -ambition, na overly ambitious national defense strategy. Um, and so we've got to achieve it. And Latour Combat Ship is, is a great example. And I haven't gone off on my, my numbers rant yet. So now's You're the time. Invited. Go ahead. Here we go. You know, <laughs> and the whole 355 ship Navy, 500 ship Navy, right. you know, it just drives me insane that we even have that conversation. Talk about capabilities, not about numbers. Why do we talk about numbers? Because we're obsessed with, you know, and that's my big thing about the budget, is we get into this epic fight. It should be 780. It should be this, this, And, okay, so we get 780, and we build a littoral combat ship, okay, which doesn't provide us the capability that we thought it was going to provide us, but there's a bunch of them. Okay. These are mutually <laughs> exclusive, right? I mean, you got to, right. you, you, you know, if you're not growing, you're shrinking. That's why the top line matters. And then, once you get your top line, you've got to be radical in terms of management of budget. But it's not a binary choice here. It isn't. But, but when you say if you're not growing, you're shrinking, you're not necessarily shrinking in capability. Okay. Well, it depends on what you mean. Let me Let's put, talk about let, ships. Well, let me, let me put it this way. Yeah. Okay. If you're not growing in capability, then you are shrinking in capability. I agree with that. But what you kind of, in a clever little jujitsu way there, there did, you said, <laughs> if you're not growing the top line, then you're shrinking in capabilities. And that I don't agree with. You can absolutely be growing the top line and not achieving the capabilities you want because you're being wasteful about the way you're that happen? the top So let's, let's play history. When have we ever seen a more effective military come out from a reduced top line? I can't think of a time when we've been able to do that. Well, we've, I, in my memory, we haven't reduced the top line hardly ever. So it's kind of, I mean, we did in the mid-90s, but yeah. in a couple other times. But look. And we flat, but, and we flat in during Budget but, Control but, but Act. The, but the conversations are, you know, sort of beside each other. Mm -hmm. I, what, what I would hope you could agree with is we have not spent defense dollars as effectively, well, it's even worse than that. We have spent defense dollars in a very ineffective way in the last 20 years, and we need to get our arms around Let's that. parse that, because I wanted to jump yeah. into this. Uh, thank you for indulging me on top-line discussion. No, no you know, we got out of it. Um, but we have done it on personnel costs and benefits. You oversaw as ranking member, I believe you're ranking member yeah. at the time, if not senior leader on the Armed Services Committee, where if you look at the growth of uh, personnel and benefit costs, we've actually wrapped our arms around them. They're expensive, but they haven't gone up. Um, modernization has gone like this, up and down, up and down. We have not managed that effectively. We've increased it at times, and then we go on diets right. and, 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 and don't look good. Um, the O&M costs we've just discussed. So actually, we have done some good management in some pockets of the defense budget. Uh, we'll get to military construction in a second. Apparently, infrastructure for military construction is not not part of the, 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 the American Jobs Act, uh, so we should talk about that. But it, isn't it really just about O&M modernization right now? Isn't that where we just need to go in terms of the managing beneath whatever top line we yeah. get? No, I, I really do think that that is absolutely true. And that's where you get into what systems are you talking about building and to accomplish what. Um, and when you look at the, the number of platforms, and I don't, I don't have the answer. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and 
correct. I should have said that up front. Um, but I think the right question is, how do we build better, more cost-effective systems at achieving our goals? We're, we're sort of living in that you know, last war. You know, the more platforms you have, you know, it's the, the, the first Gulf War, right. which was so spectacularly successful. We're not going to face that type of opponent again. Okay, so how can technology help us achieve our goals in a more cost-effective way? I'm 100% convinced that it can, but if we're focused on the top line's gotta be bigger, 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 we gotta have 500 ships, we have to have 25% more airplanes. If that's where our focus is, just throw, throw the money at the problem, then I think we're gonna be in a world of hurt. So, so point taken, uh, we gotta integrate this technology. You mentioned Bob Work, the, uh, the AI Commission. Um, when you get this budget, and it's only a skinny budget, so you don't, haven't seen the details, yeah. but when the Armed Services Committee team, your staff, comes to you, what amount of funding invested in software, AI, machine learning, the types of things you described in your remarks, would impress you? Would you be like, wow, you know, we are truly starting to integrate these technologies into our military platforms? Yeah, I think what would impress me more than the number is if we empowered the ability to buy technology more quickly. And, and Mac Thornberry did a ton of work on this uh, in terms of acquisition reform. Uh, to free up, you know, off the shelf is like, you know, an oversimplification of what we're doing here. Um, but, but it's also a big part of it is, you know, the ability to figure out what your capability needs are and get to it quicker and more effectively. And one of my favorite stories is when I went down to AFSOC, uh, mm -hmm. Air Force Special Operations Command down in Florida, back when I was chairman of that subcommittee, and they were talking about how they needed more ISR platforms. Um, and the typical way you would do this in the military is, well, you'd go through an RFP. Right. And you'd down select, and then someone would protest the award, and 20-some-odd <laughs> years later, you might have something. But because of the authority that we gave the Special Operations Command, the guy literally went on Craigslist, found, I can't remember what it was, it was like 12 or 15 P-28s that were being sold, I want to say by Brazil, I can't remember who, bought them, then went out and bought the equipment necessary to upload the ISR capability uh, onto the plane. Got the HD cameras or exactly, whatever on there, right. yeah. And presto, you know, two months later, he had 15 more ISR platforms. The more we do that, the better off we're going to be. S sounds to me, based on that anecdote, which impressed you from the special operations folks, and they have the special authorities to do that, which Congress has authorized. Yeah. Um, and, and your remarks earlier is that you really want to see a dramatic change in our program of record. The absolutely. way we manage programs of record. Oh, absolutely. And, isn't that something that Congress can go ahead and, yeah. and actually and that's mandate? I mean, just si simply say, you know, thou shall not, you know, uh, require all these boxes to be checked. Thou shall not, yeah. you know. And we've uh, done that, as you know. I mean, you Well, the authorities are there. Right, you worked with Mac. I think, I think as, much, as much of it is more a change in culture at the Pentagon is them, them choosing to, to make those choices, but also in rewarding the people at the Pentagon that make, that cho make those choices. Now, I've never worked at the Pentagon. I've worked with them for a lot of years, right. but, but my strong sense is that you are not rewarded and promoted for going outside the box, okay? You check the boxes, you did everything right, and at the end of two years, regardless of how the program's doing, and so on, then you move up. If you come in and say, look, this is all BS. We're going to jump all this. We're going we're to do something that nobody's ever done before. <laughs> right, right. That is not what you get promoted for. So Taking therefore, the people don't do that. And that's my whole point about the chess playing AI machine. Get creative. We need to encourage that type of creativity to get to the better solutions. Um, now, I've also fantasized about saying, what if we just didn't have any programs of record? <laughs> well, 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 didn't Secretary Gates do that, essentially, for the capabilities yeah. that were acquired in, in, in Iraq and Afghanistan? Yeah. I mean, it seems yeah. to be the way you, you introduce new technology, you go around the, the standard rules. Uh, we only have a, a minute or two left, and I got through about maybe 10% of the things I want to discuss with you. Sorry. Uh, but we have a panel coming up where I'm sure they'll, they'll, they'll pick up the rest. Um, supply chains. Yeah. Um, this idea of onshoring and, 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 and improving U.S. manufacturing, it's all part of the innovation base and the AI and the machine learning that you speak about. For the most part, those, that capability, that know-how, doesn't reside within the five-sided building or the industrial base which supports it. Um, you have created a task force uh, led by Congressman Slotkin and Congressman Gallagher. Tell us what you're hoping that task force will achieve and kind of inform the discussion 
uh, we're having today about the national defense. Well, I should have mentioned this up front. This is what our committee, it's building off of the task force that Seth Moulton and Jim Banks did last year, uh, which was on the future, future of defense, future right. defense technologies. How do we get to what we're talking about? How do we go from the sort of, you know, notional discussion that we're having here to nuts and bolts of the changes? How do we move into a more robust defense system? And then logically you would say, okay, where, where are we gonna get what we need? And that is the industrial-based task force that we're talking about here. Now, part of this is the worry that came out of the pandemic. Oh my goodness, we're in this huge thing and we gotta get everything from China, okay? And isn't that a problem? Um, but another part of it is what do we really need? What, what is the future of defense and what is the industrial base that, that is really needed here? Is it the same as it was 40 years ago? Mm -hmm. I don't think so. And brings me back to AI. What are we doing to make sure that we're the leaders in AI technology? That's an industrial base issue. And then the other big point, um, and I think Mac used to make this point as well, it can't just be domestic U.S., right. all right? It's a global economy. I, I'm all for made in America. I'll find whatever angles we can. If we can make it here, we should. But we are going to need a global supply chain. How do we build a trusted partner supply chain? Not just a made in America. So allies right? and friends and partners exactly. that we can rely People on. Exactly, people that, that we know that we can rely on uh, more than say Russia or China or maybe other countries. How do we make sure that we're doing that? And look, this is all really complicated. Right. I, I, I get that. I just want to see us change some of those incentives. So the incentives are greater efficiency, better use of technology, more cost-effective solutions that recognize where, where we're headed. But, but assured supply too. I mean, and, uh, yeah. last question before we wrap up. We have this Jobs Act. Uh, bill, there's uh, reportedly $50 billion for semiconductors. You know, we've known each other a long time. You're somebody I think is generally skeptical of groupthink until you've investigated it for yourself. Onshoring semiconductor capability, which of course is key uh, to introduce AI into different systems, uh, seems to be the focus. Uh, having uh, less reliance on the Asia to be that supply source, whether it's in Taiwan or South Korea. You agree with that? You think that's an approach we need to? I support? do. I mean, I, I, there's a whole bunch of different pieces to what, sure. what, when I'm talking about technology. I've talked about AI. Uh, I've talked about unmanned drones. I've talked about you know command and control, cyber. Sure. Huge part of that is 5G. I mean, that is command and control. All right. And right now, we are not where we need to be in terms of developing that future communications technology. You know, that's why Huawei and ZTE are such a problem. Right. Um, how do we build that? So I think that's a huge part of infrastructure. And you may lament uh, that the Biden administration is not willing to spend infrastructure money on Milcon, <laughs> but if the Biden administration is willing to spend infrastructure money on the 5G that we need, that's a crucial defense capability um, on a whole bunch of different issues that if we build that infrastructure, it gets us to a much better place. Well. We agree on that for sure. Chairman Adam Smith, thank you for participating in this program today. We're going to uh, have a brief break, and Chairman Smith will come back uh, for our panel discussion. Thank you. Thanks, Rock. Appreciate it. The economic impact of the COVID-19 pandemic has raised new questions about the trajectory of defense spending in the coming years. To help assess the impact of any changes to the defense budget, the Ronald Reagan Institute and the Center for Strategic and Budgetary Assessments convened current and former senior defense policy experts to examine the nation's strategic choices. Participants used CSBA's Strategic Choices tool to navigate difficult decisions, evaluate budget and capability trade-offs, and understand the consequences for strategy and national security. Yeah, CSBA uh, started developing the strategic choices tool in the wake of the Budget Control Act as a way of portraying different strategic choices and the political, strategic, and operational consequences of different budget choices. The Reagan Institute, of course, uh, hosts the Reagan National Defense Forum. And for years, we've had people come in, panels, experts talking about budgets and what it means when we make reductions in our budgets or why we need to increase the budgets. But those conversations, in my opinion, have come stale over time. The tool contains over a thousand different budget choices and, and attaches budgetary costs uh, to them. Well, if we look back over the last 10 years with the Budget Control Act, uh, after another recession and a desire to restrain federal spending, 
we could see a repeat of that, which will put pressure specifically on the defense top line. While the department will not see any likely reduced demand for mission and presence, uh, nor will the strategic objectives be diminished. Make sure industry understands uh, what are the most critical capabilities, what are the uh, most critical things they need to be able to do in support of that national security and creating the capability to ultimately support uh, those young men and women that raise the right hands for our North Dakota Constitution. Exercise has allowed us to go deeper, to have a more substantive discussion, and really delve into what it means when we make substantial, significant changes to our defense budget. And it's up to them to decide if they want to accept the risk. But don't try and make it easy for them by covering up the difficulties of the, of the choices that they're making. So I think this kind of exercise is really important to the process. Nature of this business, and we have more, more, more good people come in. It's great, it's right. great to have them at the Pentagon. So, well, well, good morning, everybody, and uh, welcome to our uh, our panel discussion on the on the future defense budget. My name is Tom Mankin. I'm the president and CEO of the Center for Strategic and Budgetary Assessments, and uh, we're joined here uh, not only with uh, by uh, Chairman Smith, but uh, also Mackenzie Eaglin from the American Enterprise Institute and General Hawk Carlisle from the National Defense Industrial Association. And what I wanted to do is really follow on to the conversation, Chairman Smith, you, uh, you had with, uh, with Roger Zockheim and also on to the, uh, uh, the strategic choices exercise that uh, we just saw a film about, a strategic choices exercise that CSBA did in conjunction with the, uh, the Reagan Institute back in October and that looked at the prospect of, of cuts to the defense budget as well as uh, an increase in the defense budget. And uh, both uh, Hawk Carlisle and Mackenzie Eaglin were participants in that exercise. And I think, to me at least, one of the things that that, that exercise really drove home was, if we are talking about cuts to defense, to make that work, either you need to make some, uh, some pretty strong political assumptions and strategic assumptions about the uh, the types of conflicts we are and aren't going to be involved with. And you talked about that in your remarks. Uh, but equally, uh, one of the things that, that came out was to make, to be able to balance the, the budget with, uh, with those cuts. Congress needs to do some things that historically uh, it's been reluctant to do. And whether those were uh, large cuts to manpower, whether they were uh, uh, prematurely retiring aircraft carriers, large cuts to force structure. Um, again, uh, I'll, I'll call on uh, you know Hawk and McKenzie based on their experience, but I guess the question is uh, first to you, Chairman Smith, about that. Do you see Congress willing to do the types of things that might be needed if we are actually facing a, a, a cut in the defense budget? And I'm deeply worried about and that this could get me off into a long rant about the state of politics today, which I won't get into. Uh, well, I'll get into it a little bit. Re reality um, is not allowed to intrude into our political decisions increasingly. Um, and and, and that, that creates a problem. People imagine that you know, they can have whatever they want and Congress is certainly part of that problem. I mean, I think if you were able to say, look, we have to cut these programs in order to achieve this objective. You, you would have a better chance, but everyone, everyone you know, creates their own facts, makes up their own arguments, and these arguments all come back to protecting their own peripheral interests. So without a shadow of a doubt, and I would have wanted to say this in my opening remark, Congress is a huge part of the problem, because for many members of Congress, when it comes to the defense budget, it's a very simple equation. How much money are you spending in my district? And if the program in question that you're talking about being cut is going to hurt me in my district, by the way, I've seen people on the far right of the spectrum feel this way. I've seen people on the far left of the spectrum feel this way. Um, and that is an enormous problem. And, you know, I could ramble on here at great length, um, but I don't have the answer to that problem other than to make the opposite argument. That what we as members of Congress are supposed to do is to spend taxpayer dollars effectively, not just focus on how to bring back as much money as is humanly possible to our district or our state. I'll make that argument, but I'm deeply worried about its ability to succeed for the reasons you stated. Okay, uh, Mackenzie, how about you? What are your thoughts? Uh, I'm also deeply worried, uh, as as the chairman is, uh, and for other reasons. I 
I see, I will caveat that by saying, I'm seeing some small signs of progress on this, for example. So like when the department proposed, as the chairman knows last year, um, for example, in the Navy's budget to reca uh, recapture basically expiring unused funds and be able to funnel that back into specifically into shipping. I feel like that's the kind of scalable idea that would, would help uh, across the board as opposed to returning it to the treasury, which doesn't actually really happen quite like that. But, you know, the, that's the thinking, right? Um, to changing the color of money. You know, the, the challenge here that I see and my colleague at ADI, uh, former acting comptroller Elaine McCusker, she's been writing and talking a lot about this. You know, the more information the department provides, Congress is increasingly like unsatisfied. And so, this relationship is, it's a, it's a, it's a, I think a, it's gonna be a while to rebuild that trust, but it certainly is possible when the department is a good customer and they find a friend in Congress. Um, so there are some, you know, small pockets of hope, but, you know, overall, I think that the, the, the parochial interests are, are there. I see a challenge here with appropriators and I can pick on them and the chairman, can, he doesn't have to say anything, he can just smile, but I'll be the one to, you know, a lot of times uh, the issues are not with the algorithms, to be frank, uh, in terms of modernizing defense resource structures, I find that the appropriators tend to uh, think differently, uh, slightly less open-minded perhaps than authorizers. Uh, and so perhaps there's something that can be done. Maybe the chairman is thinking about how he can build bridges to his counterpart on that committee. Uh, and. I, I hear they're thinking about you know, planning and programming and budgeting reform uh, on the House Appropriations Subcommittee for Defense right now. Uh, so these are the kinds of things that could happen, but, uh, but since we're in such a hurry, as the chairman knows, the challenge here is to move at speed, as you know, some of the Joint Chiefs have been talking about. And I think that's gonna be a double problem this year since you may not even get the budget until late May, but I'll be cheering you on and helping you think it uh, Hawk, how about you? Yeah, so I'll make it a clean sweep. I, I couldn't agree more with uh, Chairman Smith and uh, McKenzie. You know, I, I have the battle scars from my days in uniform of trying to retire airplanes. And, and you know, one person's uh, legacy is another person's requirement. Uh, and there's the political angle that uh, the chairman talks about that, that's hugely challenging. The worst possible condition we could be in is where we to cut the defense budget and we don't do it strategically as uh, chairman smith says so uh, the ability to get to those tough decisions of getting to strategic choices which in the near term can affect districts and states differently and that that's going to be a huge challenge the only bright spot in my uh, opinion I, I agree with mckenzie 100 i think the appropriation side of this is one that we need to look hard at uh, but, you know, the encouraging sign to me is that uh, Chairman Reed and Senator Inhofe and uh, Chairman Smith and Congressman Rogers, those committees uh, are bipartisan. And, I, you know, they look at the strategic side of it. And, and you got to hope that the way the legislation goes and the authorizers, you can make it uh, to that we do get to the, those strategic choices. But um, and, and, you know, frankly, the department's got, uh, there's equal blame to go around, I will tell you. The, the department's got to be better at, at really articulating how and what they want to do and why they want to do it and how it fits into that national security strategy and ultimately the national defense strategy, which again, Chairman Smith, I think very eloquently and articulately talked about at the outset is, it's got to be a, a strategy that that is that has those strategic decisions made, and we have a, a goal that we're moving towards, um, and not a uh, you know put a bandaid on everything on every corner of the globe, and and we'll send in U.S. military you know everywhere. We frankly, it's impossible. We just can't get there from here. So I I agree. I think there's challenges. I'm hoping that our uh, SASC and Hask uh, can can mount some of the uh, legislation that'll that'll allow us to do what we need to do well well hawk you make a great point you know as, as part of these uh, strategic choices you know more and more we we hear about legacy systems and the need to uh divest in legacy systems um often with a not a lot of a not, not a lot of detail uh, i think oftentimes i think that uh, the word legacy is bandied about as code word for something i don't like uh, and so I, I'll start again with you, Chairman Smith. I mean, how do you think about legacy systems? How do you think about divestitures? 
um, how should you know uh, how should we be thinking about what exactly a, a legacy system is? You should think about capabilities. Um, you should think about what does that system do, do for you? I mean, uh, the B-52 bomber, right? you don't get much more legacy than that. And yet it has a very clear capability that we need right now, um, as opposed to other systems. I think what, what we really need to get to, and this is what you know, I think the task force that Seth Moulton and Jim Banks did, um, what Alyssa Slotkin um, and Mike Gallagher are working on, what our new subcommittee that Jim Langerman is the chairman of, um, that is focused on, on AI and technology needs to get at is the answer to that question. Mm -hmm. I think we all can understand that, you know, the, the first Gulf War uh, war that we fought so successfully, that's gone. Okay, that, that's not happening in the future. Um, we need to prepare for something different. And then we can look at, you know, uh, Christian Brose's book mm -hmm. um, on the kill chain, where he really gets into some of the analysis of some of the conflicts that have been fought in the last decade that show you a little bit about some of the new capabilities that you're going to need, the importance of space, the importance of satellites, the importance of command and control and cyber, and how that could perhaps be more important than large platforms. I think we know all of that. What my committee is trying to do right now is to, as I said, put meat on those bones. Okay, what does that mean? Okay, what, what do you spend money on and what do you stop spending money on? And right now, I don't have the answer to that question. I've got a vague outline. We are working right now in our committee to get that answer. And then as McKenzie quite correctly pointed out, it's great if we come up with the answer, but if the appropriators go, okay, that's cute. Um, we're still gonna spend the money here. Um, we gotta bring them along. But that's what we're working on right now. And I also, again, I wanna compliment you know, Mark Esper and some of the others. They, you know, Bob worked when he was uh, in the Pentagon. They really dove into this, try to answer that. We haven't answered it. And it's part of the problem because then if you run into you know, appropriators, you run into parochialism, you run into the defense contractors who want to protect their bottom line, you know, you better, you better be all geared up because there are, there are people who are going to want to want to not let you make the changes. And that's where we're getting and the Marine Corps is working on it right now. It's coalescing. Is it going to get there? Um, I don't know, but that's what I'm working on. And yeah, just uh, before I turn to Mackenzie, as you point out, the Marine Corps is doing a lot, uh, and uh, Commandant Berger is doing a lot to try to change Marine Corps force design. And yet, then Congress doesn't fund uh, some of the missiles, you know, the missile systems that are that are key to that force design, right? Yeah, no, it is a it is a multi sided, very complicated battle. But I really stand by my overall overall point here, and that is that. And this is why, and I know Roger did, didn't like that I want to talk. I mean, we can obsess over five or $10 billion, okay? Should it be a seven? We had an epic fight in 2019 over whether or not the defense budget should be 733 or 750. And what I'm telling you is that borders on irrelevant compared to the answer to the question that you asked, okay? Getting to the point of what we should fund, what capabilities we should be looking for, that's where and it's not an easy question to answer. If it was, I'd answer it right now. It's not easy. That's where the focus has to be. And what I worry about is we get trapped in this sort of bumper sticker optic of I'm for a strong defense because I'm for more money. Okay, that no, that doesn't connect. Okay, you know, what are the capabilities? That's where I want the debate to go. You know, obsessing over five or 10 or 15 billion dollars. That right now, with the pace of technology change, with the rise of China, with all of that, we've got to fundamentally change what we view as the capabilities we need to provide the right defense. That's what we need to figure out, and that's what we're working towards. But there are all the impediments that, 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 that we've mentioned just in the last few minutes here. So it's, it's a tough fight, but that's the right fight. In my Mackenzie, uh, your thoughts? Well, Tom, as you know, as a member of the same commission that Roger was on, um, uh, and as the chairman pointed out, it's not necessarily, legacy doesn't equal age, right? Uh, the commission's work, I think, was so great because for those who don't have a clearance and or don't have the time to make it to the SCIF, uh, to know what the operational challenges identified in the National Defense Strategy are, the commission gave its own version of unclassified challenges, operational challenges that the department needs to be prepared, uh, that the military needs to be prepared to respond to, uh, to deter, or to, to win, et cetera. Um, if, it, if a certain capability isn't relevant to those scenarios, I think that's a, one lens to look through, is it a legacy system or not? The challenge will be is if 
this administration fundamentally rewrites the national defense strategy as the chairman was indicating. I, I, I am I'm fascinated by the outcome if, if he agrees if, um, with Roger that it's not a big change, but I'll leave that to the chairman to decide. So if this new team wants to, to change, which would be understandable, although I think there was, uh, there is a, a relatively strong bipartisan consensus on the strategy as it's mostly written, um, that's one lens, like I said, by which to look through it. And then the, the second is exactly what all of these other um, big thinkers are talking about, right? So the AI commission like Bob Wood, like um, the future of defense task force. So if you look across the department's technology portfolio and what are considered you know, super important, and the chairman spoke of winning the AI race, of course, but then there's also you know, hypersonic weapons, uh, uh, quantum computing, big data, uh, different types of uh, directed energy lasers. You just keep going down the list. And most of those technologies require one common thing, and that is more energy. And in many cases, that means more electricity. So even if you have things that are old uh, that can be upgraded, if they can't power more of these technologies, then they're also not going to be useful in the fight of the future. You have to be able to generate and access more energy. Uh, and without that, we're really just whistling past the great lakes. Well, how about you? Yeah, I think uh, I, I, I would reiterate exactly what the chairman and McKinsey said. You know, the question is um, to do what? Uh, and I think that's what the chairman raised earlier. Um, I, it, the national defense strategy is going to define it. And then you're going to look at our combatant commanders in the Department of Defense and go, what are the concept of operations and what environment are you going to operate? We talk about the Indo-Pacific theater and what that environment looks like. I spent a majority of my career in that, in that environment. And I will tell you the challenges you face and the concept of operations is key to what you need and what you don't need. I, and, and I think that's the to do what. And the other part that I can't uh, more strongly agree with Chairman Smith, and that is let's con concentrate on capability. I mean, I, and I don't want to relitigate, but again, the battle scars from the A-10 fight, it was focused on the A-10. It was only focused on the platform. The capability was close air support. And, you know, I, I know this got um, totally disregarded in many cases, but you could put a B-52 with precision weapons, had eight times more weapons than an A-10, and it could stay on station eight times longer. Uh, it didn't have a gun and it couldn't fly low. So that was a capability match that you had to determine which one fit better. Um, but, but you got into that capability discussion and, and the B-52 is a great example. If you look at the CONOPS in the Pacific, um, you have a standoff capability with long range weapons. The B-52 has got a great capability there. It's got SWAP as McKinsey talks about uh, that can handle that. Uh, so that's a capability discussion. So, uh, you know, I think if, if we, the, the, those are the two key points, right? Get to the strategic decision on what the national defense strategy is going to be, what the CONOPs are and where we're going to operate, and then concentrate on the capabilities we need to, to, to deter. And then ultimately, if we have to fight in that environment uh, and not get into the eaches or the platforms or the you know, uh, the individual things that we're looking at, but more the capability and the strategic choices we make. Well, Hawk, you mentioned uh, concepts and, you know, the, the National Defense Strategy Commission that's it's already been mentioned several times. You know, one of the, one of our uh, uh, big findings was that the Defense Department hadn't moved as far as fast as it should uh, when uh, it comes to developing joint operational concepts. And certainly the services are doing uh, their own, they have their own efforts to develop operational concepts. Uh, I think for each of you, again, starting with, with Chairman Smith, how, how do you evaluate the services efforts and the joint effort to develop the types of concepts that we're going to need to be successful in the 21st century? And also the types of concepts that can help legislators judge, you know, what's, what's vital versus what's nice to have versus maybe what's even superfluous. I think they're really trying. Um, and I think this this started uh, probably the second um, Obama term. You know, as we started to look, okay, what 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 will the world look like when we don't have two hundred thousand troops in Iraq and Afghanistan fighting a, a hot war right now? And that was Ash Carter and Bob Work, and then building into uh, the secretaries under. I think they're really trying to get to that answer. 
Um, but they, you know, they have the basic impediments that we're all aware of that we've already discussed. You know, one certainly is, you know, the parochial interest of members of Congress. Second is, you know, and this is what I really try to emphasize, defense contractors, you know, they, they like to get paid. Um, and if this current system's working out for them, they got no incentive to come up with a new one. We need to build those incentives into place. And then in, in the Pentagon itself, and I mentioned this in the remarks earlier, and I, you know, I haven't worked in the Pentagon, so I don't know the ins and outs of this as well as I would like, but my sense is the Pentagon does not reward the type of leadership and the type of actions amongst its members that would lead towards answering that question. Um, they reward doing it the way it's always been done. You know, I always kind of joke, you know, that the mission was a success. We achieved 99% of our objectives. Everybody died, but we checked every box all the way up there. So it's all good. We need to change that culture. And, and I, this, not to keep coming back to my favorite topic, but on fighter attack aircraft, and as Hawk was mentioning, you know, when you look at the capabilities, this is the question that I really want to answer. It's not so much lamenting the 20 years and how far the, you know, the F-35 is over budget. Um, and all that, it's, this is a huge decision as we go forward. As you know, we are developing new capabilities beyond the F-35. We have upgraded the capabilities of the F-18 and the F-15. So when we're looking at the next 25 years, what is the most cost-effective way to achieve the fighter attack aircraft capabilities that we're actually going to need? And I, and I don't think that we're really getting at that question because everyone's got their own thing to protect. All right. And right now, the F-35 is working out really well for a lot of people because it's generating a lot of cash. Um, but that's not what's in the best interest of our national security policy necessarily. All right. Let's ask the question exactly as Hawk described it when he was looking at the difference between the A-10 and the B-52 and what they bring to the fight. And then I would add just one other element. It matters what it costs. It does. OK. And I think there's a tendency within the military and the Pentagon do not want to do that. And I get why. Okay. You know, my guys are on there on the front line and you're telling me that I'm not going to give them what they need to survive because it costs a little bit more money. No, what I'm telling you is if we can get them a good enough capability and then we can get more of it and cover more things, then that's going to make it more likely that they're going to survive uh, because we're not going to have to, you know, put all our, all of our eggs in one basket and not have them on it. That's the type of complicated discussion that we need to have. They're trying, they're not there yet. And what I really want Congress, Hask, and SAS to do is to help them get there, bottom line. Mackenzie, how would you uh, rate the, the state of play when it comes to service and uh, joint concepts? I'm like jumping out of my chair to, to jump it, to talk now. Um, I agree with the chairman that the services are really trying. And I've seen a lot of great uh, guidance coming out in the last year in particular. Right, the tri service maritime strategy. The Army's put out an Arctic strategy, a multi domain operation strategy, and, and another one, um, competition, I believe. Uh, so, you they're trying, and I know the joint concept is apparently you know pending uh, in the building inside the building that was started as the chairman noted. Actually, some of this work was started in the Obama administration, continued through the Trump administration, and wrapping up now. So, I'm pleased to see that, but two points I want to raise, Tom. One is, um, and this, the commission foot stomped this point, you know, thinking bigger about um, the proposals that come from the department to Congress about the longer term consequences, right? So the department had such a hard time building the joint concept over the last, say, half decade, because in 2010, the decision was made by Secretary Gates to propose closing joint forces command. So they gave away the brain power, as it were, um, uh, to and the institutional memory about wargaming, about analysis, and this is on the uniform and civilian side, right? The, the commissioners certainly can talk more about this. Um, so um, the department basically had to rely on, you know, experts from RAND and other places to help them uh, until they could regain that institutional knowledge and, and expertise internal to the department. And that was hugely consequential. So we had, I, I think there needs to be more debate over such big ideas like that uh, as they come forward. Uh, in the future. And then the second one is, with all the good news about the big thinking of the services, is there's a risk of this sort of kitchen sink approach, right? There's so much in these documents and so much in these concepts. I'm worried that if, when it trickles down to you know, the, the squad or platoon level, it's going to be challenging to, for that group, uh, a 
uniform personnel to absorb everything that's in there, one. And two, I'm greatly concerned. Let's go back to technology and all of the priorities the chairman talked about, which I really never share in the department. I'm worried that the Department of Defense, which is no longer an inventor, right? It's an innovator now. It has to take commercial off-the-shelf technologies in March in many cases, not always, but um, in many cases now they are a customer of Silicon Valley and other places like that. The concepts are too often to me saying, here's the war, you know, how we hope to fight the war. Now bring me the technology, as opposed to saying what technology is available right now, and then we're going to go build a concept around it. The turning of the telescope, I think this is completely foreign inside thinking inside the Department of Defense, and I'm really worried they've got it backwards. Talk? Yeah, I, uh, I, I, let me uh, agree with McKinsey 100%. I think Joint Forces Command, having a combatant commander in uniform, that his job was to devise and and, and further those joint concepts, you know, the loss of that to me was a loss to the department. Uh, but, you know, the department's done pretty good. The joint warfighting concept, there's a joint uh, concept for long range fires, there's a joint uh, concept for uh, logistics under fire, there's, uh, they're working the joint concept, JADC2, Joint All Domain Command and Control, and what uh, the vice chairman, uh, John Heighton's doing with the Joint Requirements Oversight Council, I, I think they're moving forward, but you know, fundamentally, I think one of the challenges is that the money starts in the services. It, it's stovepiped inside the department. And I was a programmer in the Air Force, and, you know, I have that stamped on my forehead. Um, but when it starts in the services, services pick solutions that work for them that may not always be the best solution for the joint, uh, the joint fight. And when it gets to OSD, they can move money at the margins in programs. Uh, but it, it can become a challenge, uh, you know, that late in the game, actually, when, when they're moving it. So, you know, this is probably sacrilege to a lot of people inside the Pentagon. But the way the money is, is divided up, um, you know, the, is a big fight. And when resources start going down, if you get flat budgets or declining budgets, it gets worse. So you become less joint because you become more parochial, unfortunately, trying to protect your own program. So... Um, I see, you know, maybe in the acquisition reform or in the reform, I think one of the big things as we move forward and make these strategic choices is the department needs that reform and that Congress can help. And, and it, it's got to be something uh, to stay with the adversaries that we face today in China and Russia in particular. We can't keep doing things the way we've been doing them for the last seven decades. We've got to change and the department's got to change internally uh, to address that. And the last thing I'll say, I, 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 I think Chairman Smith hit, hit it, the nail on the head and we talked about how you make these decisions. It's, you know, it's that capability and capacity discussion. It, how much it costs does matter. You can have one gold-plated platform that can do everything absolutely in the world, but can only be one place at a time. Or you can have a lot of low-end capability and you have tons and tons and tons of it, but it can't really, doesn't really have capability to do the mission. So how do we accurately get to that combination of capability and capacity under the national defense strategy to do what we need to do so we have the capability where we need it and we have the capacity where we need it so i think that's the way we got to look at this going forward well we've we've gotten some uh, some some great questions uh and i'd like to turn to as many of them as uh, as as we can in the uh, the time that we have left um first one i'd like to pose is actually from matt donovan former uh, sec uh, acting uh, secretary of the Air Force. And it's about, it's about Space Force. Uh, and uh, Secretary Donovan's question is, uh, the Biden administration has articulated support for the US Space Force, although not as strong as some uh, might like to see. With both China and Russia coming on strong and developing their military space capabilities, where do you see the priority being placed uh, in the FY22 defense budget for the Space Force? And again, I'll, I'll turn Chairman Smith to you first, and then uh, to uh, Mackenzie and, and Hong. Yeah, yeah, I think the Space Force is, is crucial, and I think what we really need to do is sort of divide the concept of the you know, Space Force um, from what it does, because there are a lot of politics that got involved in the creation of it in the first place, um, you know, but it absolutely makes sense. And, I mean, that was the way, I mean, Pre President Trump, you know, you know, sort of championed it, but it wasn't his idea. Uh, Mike Rogers and Jim Cooper were the ones who came up with it for very sound reasons. Um, and I think a lot of people get hung up on the idea of, you know, what do we need to space? space is crucial. 
okay, we need a group of people who are trained first and foremost to do that. So I think you will see as the Biden administration gets into this, as Secretary Austin, they will see how important this is. They will fund it and they will support it. Um, it connects everything, as you know. So I, I, I am quite confident the Biden administration will be you know, as committed to this um, as they get into it as, as everyone else uh, was previously. Mackenzie? I'm so glad to hear that. I, I agree. It's incredibly important, not just for what it is that it's meant to do, uh, but also the ability, because of its size, to try out new and innovative ideas like the chairman was talking about with recruiting, right? You can do that with this nascent service that um, is small enough to run pilot programs on, you know, if you can't, as it turns out, if you can't pass the PT test, but you're brilliant at this thing that we really need, and we only need you for a few years until your skills expire, and then go back refresh them in the private, you know, that kind of um, uh, recruiting and retention and training and development of, of uh, service members is terrific. This is a great service to, to try that out. Um, I know it's being tried in some cases in smaller ways and other services and components, um, but this force can be the innovator, um, sort of the hotbed of innovation, I think, not you know, in terms of human resources policy, uh, one. And then secondly, it helps the U.S. Air Force, as Matt knows very well, then get back to its core competency, which I think is also hugely helpful. I'm really pleased that Congress, you know, again, you're determined, right, you know, this, this idea generated on Capitol Hill, Congress took the lead, the department kicked and screamed, and particularly the Air Force, but now I think they see it for what it is, which is a huge benefit to the service to focus on their core competencies, to, to, to fly, fight, and win, so to speak, um, to do that mission even better and more precise and more effectively, as we talked about. When I say effective, I mean monetarily in particular, but in other ways too. Spock? Yeah, so, you know, I, I think, uh, again, I, I agree with uh, Chairman and McKinsey. You know, five years ago, you couldn't say war fighting in space. It, it's just the nature of the beast. Unfortunately, our potential adversaries didn't abide by that. And we know what the Chinese did. We know what the Russians did. So I think the, the you know, what uh, uh, Congressman Rogers, Congressman Cooper did with Hey, we're finding in space is reality. Our adversaries are there, and so we have to have to uh, address that. And it's going to require some significant effort to be able to do that. And I'll steal a statement from SOCOM. I think the chairman's comment about AFSOC developing ISR capability in a couple of months in his earlier talk is spot on. We developed AFSOC, and we gave them authorities and gave them ability, and we built a culture and an, and, and a way of doing things that allows them to operate really quickly inside of that. Uh, time frame that you can't do in the normal traditional process. I think the whole Pentagon needs to change to that. But with the development of the Space Force, if you know, if you take the term by, with, and through, we're going to fight in space, with, in space, with space, and through space in the future. That's just where we're at. And so how we go forward in, in the Space Force, and Jay Raymond, uh, you know, is a great friend of mine, and he's absolutely the right person to do this, is exactly like McKinsey said, is as we developed SOCOM, we gave them great authority, they developed the culture, and they do things quickly. I think we need the Space Force to do the same thing, and I think Jay Raymond will make that happen. He'll be able to do things faster, we'll be able to operate quicker, we'll be able to develop capability quicker, and, and uh and take advantage of that, uh, that new culture that they're going to develop inside the Space Force and move forward. So, I, you know, I think um, it's something that's a necessity. I think we have to do it. And I think uh, the Space Force has a potential to move out really rapidly. Well, our next question, I think, unfortunately, our, our, last, our last one is about the uh, budget process. And it's, it's from Joe Gould of Defense News. And the question is, uh, given the timing of the Biden administration's budget, how will the compressed schedule uh, affect the uh, committee's work on the NDAA? And I'd say more broadly for the, for the panel, Congress's work on the NDAA. And what are the prospects for a timely budget deal versus continuing resolutions that stretch beyond December? So uh, Chairman Smith, we're all, we're all waiting to hear. It's a huge problem. And in fact, to thank you for this. I've been figuring out, I've been trying to figure out for the last hour plus how I can work this into the answer to your question. I am deeply concerned about the Biden administration dragging their feet on getting us the damn budget, okay? And I understand they have other priorities, and that's the answer that we get back. And let me just say, this is not an OMB problem, okay? OMB wants this like now, all right? But they got to get the numbers from the White House and from the cabinet positions. 
And the White House itself is not doing the job they should be doing right now. And I am really worried if we get into mid to late May and we don't have the specific budget numbers, then you're guaranteed a continuing resolution. We can't, we don't have the time to do our job. So, you know, shout it from the rafters. I can't get the White House to take my calls on this one. You know, just send it to us. We, we need it in order to pass the budget and, and move forward. And yes, I know that the, you know, the pandemic is more important. The vaccine is more important. You know, the COVID relief package was important. The infrastructure package is important. But within all of that, if you could just find the time uh, to fill out the budget, um, it's like I'm talking to my son about why it's a bad thing to have 60 assignments that are late. Uh, well, you know, they're not actually due. I can get them done. Yeah. Um, but we just we need to move the process forward here. So I cannot strongly enough urge um, the Biden administration and Ron Klain and everyone driving the ship over there, get us the numbers before May 10th. Thanks. Mackenzie, what are, what are your thoughts? That was my question and that is my answer. <laughs> Joe's question is mine and the chairman's answer is shared. I, I'm also worried I would throw in there about not just obviously the Congress's inability to do oversight absent a large volume of information that comes with that budget, right? All the justifications, all of the strategic thinking and analysis behind it. Uh, but I'm also worried about, there's not a lot of conversations about a two-year budget deal. So, you know, this is the wild, wild west, fiscally speaking, where there's, you know, the Budget Control Act era is over, and there's, in, without a, you know, an agreement between the two parties on, on what the numbers should be just overall, generally speaking, I don't see how you can have regular order and have appropriations bills move through that regular order, which also guarantees a continuing resolution. So, like, everything is all signs pointing to a continuing resolution, which, of course, does unique damage to the military more so than any other federal entity because partly because of its sheer size and what it contracts out every year. And Hawk, to you on this point and, and kind of the signal, the signal that it sends. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I think, you know, one of the things the Hask and Sask understand this real well, continuing resolutions is a really bad strategic choice. It actually hurts us. It makes things cost more. It gives us inability to plan ahead. It, it hurts uh, the department. It hurts industry. Uh, they're just bad. And, and again, the Hask and SAS understand that. I don't think everybody does. I think it's an education process. Certainly, I think there's members of Congress that don't fully understand how much it hurts and how much it increases the cost of everything we do. And, and the American public certainly doesn't understand it. So the ability to get back to regular order and, and have it on time. And I think, again, I think the Hask and Sask, I, I agree the appropriations uh, needs to work on this uh, as we go forward. Um, and, you know, this is, this is an opportunity. And, you know, I'm, I'm with the, the Chairman Smith on the administration not moving forward. This is kind of the, we're still on honeymoon for one thing, a little bit. Uh, and we haven't started the big time uh, midterm election campaigning yet. So this is the time when a two-year deal, a budget deal, makes most, most sense and has the most probability of success. Um, and the fact that we haven't moved out on that is the part that is, is disconcerting because it drives us to something that's a really bad strategic choice going forward. And, and you know, when we get in next year, a year from now, we all know that it's going to be a significantly politically charged time as we approach the midterms. Uh, and it's even harder to do. So, I, I mean, I'm, again, 100% with Chairman Smith and McKenzie is the administration needs to move out and get that budget over there as soon as they possibly can. Well, I think that's the, uh, that's the right uh, topic to end this, uh, to end this discussion on. Uh, and I think we'll, we'll all be watching as, as, we, uh, as we move forward. But, but as we do, I want to thank you, uh, Chairman Smith, uh, McKenzie, Hawk, for, uh, for your participation and thank all of you uh, watching for your attention. Uh, this is an important issue. It's a vital issue for, for, for the nation and for national defense. And uh, we will we'll continue the conversation as things go forward. But uh, uh, for now, thank you for your time and, and have a wonderful day. Thanks. Thank you.